Bueno, estimado vicerrector, director de la escuela, autoridades. Director de la escuela, autoridades, universidad de la comunidad. Este acto no habría sido posible sin la colaboración de muchas personas. This event couldn't have been able without the cooperation of many people. Quería dar las gracias en primer lugar al personal de la oficina en Rotterdam. I would like to thank the Rotterdam office of MVRDV for the help in the setup of this uh, our guest trip. I also want to thank all the companies who have cooperated without uh, whose help it wouldn't have been possible for us to count on the presence of Mr. Jacob today here. Finally, I wanted to thank the uh, trade union, the students' union, uh, for their help. It is uh, 11 years ago that uh, the University of Malaga uh, founded the, uh, the, the faculty of architecture. With all its advantages and disadvantages of such a period in life, the youth of uh, our school is a period at which we still can uh, probe imaginary horizons, entering to uh, unknown tracks. We are so full that last year we did to invite a Pritz uh, Prize, a Pritz uh, uh, holder uh, who accepted that. So our uh, small foolishness is uh, help us go ahead. This year we are lucky to count on the presence of a representative of one of uh, uh, the members of one of the topmost uh, architectural offices in, in the world. Uh, the perception of the world surrounding us should be something to be offered to our students. Architects, uh, artists, uh, thinkers have got the, the doors of the faculty wide open. MVRDV was founded by Universe Jacob van Riechs and Natalie Devery. Right now, its staff is made up uh, by almost 200 people in the offices in Shanghai and Rotterdam. Usually, you should praise uh, uh, the, your guest uh, speaking about uh, his or her career. But I'm going to focus on uh, different on different aspects because I'm sure you know the career our guest uh, uh, has followed. Otherwise, we wouldn't have such a numerous audience today. We see that the design philosophy behind our uh, guest uh, personality focuses on green urban clarity philosophy. So we are facing an architectural office with a contemporary view on perspective over architecture. In the 21st century, in a globalized world, there's no possibility to do this work if it's not for the application of these basic concepts I've just mentioned. Its projects are, do not come out of uh, just fortunate uh, ideas. Uh, the members of the MVRDV uh, office looks for uh, specific ideas out of uh, long research processes. This has led them to create a significant database which will help them face any challenge. Always supported on the digital world and uh, counting on the help of research on digital research. This interactivity of the prior processes allows them to generate a big number of prototypes and allows also to them to explore multiple abilities in terms of design and self-assessment. This couldn't be possible without uh, another foundation, that of cooperation. They uh, rely on the advice of sociologists, programmers, uh, artists, so they create flexible teams both with uh, internal staff and uh, outsourcing con contractors. The prior complexity uh, that uh, was referred to before is turning to clear, uh, clearly understood uh, 
solutions uh, with a specific idea above all, the improvement of the quality of life of people. And this means both the, the immediate uh, environment and the outer space. We're living through a process of crisis uh, especially now in terms of uh, the environment, uh, even if some politicians do not want to acknowledge it. The news of the last uh, months uh, tell us of the complexity of the current world. These problems are also present in the development of projects by NBRDV. So the economy is the engine of the methodology of their office. Its projects should be efficient, as if it was the case of a machine, and they should uh, cluster or include the concept of added value while respecting our environment and making a firm bet uh, for changes in the uses uh, and demanding buildings uh, to be more efficient and seeking a better uh, balance. Mr. Jacob, for this modest school of architecture, it is an honor and a pleasure to listen to your words. Welcome to the university, and I hope our audience enjoys your conference. Thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you, Antonio, for your nice words. Thank you all present in this room. It's a great view over here. I have to take a picture because this is just... Uh, a full, a full stage, you know. I, I give lectures every now and then, but uh, you know, all the seats are taken. That's great. Um, so thank you for the invitation, and I think it's very. I'm honored to be here uh, for this inauguration lecture. I think that's a good tradition. Uh, actually, I'm also teaching in the university in uh, Germany in Berlin, but we don't have this phenomenon. I think we should bring it back and that we have a moment that we start a year and I think uh, that's why I also start maybe with a little bit of a uh, maybe more like a message or a question to the to the students and um, about the future of architecture and uh, as you I think I see also some elderly students but mostly uh, younger students um, and um, I think you are the you're brave to study architecture I think it's good that next generation keeps on, on, on going, but I think you, you should also realize that the world uh, changed and the perception of architecture and the, and the role of architecture too. And even, uh, I'm also realizing this when I'm, when I'm teaching, that, that almost you're always behind. So the, when you are finished your school, the world is already changing and maybe your education is already uh, uh, slightly behind the reality. Like, uh, for instance, this, this old picture, you see the architect is a kind of, uh, yeah, everybody believed him, eh? he was the real, the hero. Uh, that's not anymore the case, sorry. Um, you see, this is a great study done by the British Institute of Architects about the future of architecture. And uh, they, they estimated and they looked at, at what the world was, what, what trends are happening in the world. And uh, you can see that there's actually a positive signs there, you have more people, more construction, uh, bigger cities, so that looks pretty good yeah, for to be an architect. However, it's not that simple. And um, of course, you, you, the, the, the way architecture is being made changes and the roles of architecture is changing. Maybe a lot of buildings are being made without architects. So something to, to think about. And, and this is a graph we made for the magazine Architecture d'Aujourd'hui quite a, some time ago, uh, explaining uh, the, the, the development say, of the architects. Where in the beginning, let's say, the times of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the architect did everything. He was uh, also the engineer, he was the, the, the kind of uh, person who designed basically everything included in, around it. And this developed into a broader and broader thing where the, the, the architect became, uh, let's say, smaller, smaller, smaller part of the whole process. Other specialists appeared on the scene. Like you have uh, the planners, the engineers, the designers, the managers, many managers. And, and, the, and you see as well on the, on the other side all these different new professions that popped up, so to say. And this, is, this will change, of course. And it will, there will be new professions coming. And there, there's not one architect anymore. There's many different ones. So you can maybe think about what type of architect you want to be. Yeah, so there's not the homo universalis where the architect is God, forget about it. You have maybe have to find your own specialty and your own maybe passion where you can maybe differentiate yourself from, uh, from others or maybe find others that are, are a bit like you. Yeah? 
Um, so yeah, in the same study from the British architects, uh, there was a, maybe an, an alarming note that was the reduction in demand for architectural services. So you see that actually, despite the, the growth in construction, there is actually a, a reduction in demand for architects. And that has to do with that we work more efficient. You can say that one architect can build more in less time. That's one reason. But also others do the work of architects that, that was done by work by architects that was work that was done by architects before. For instance, you have all kind of new software that helps other people that are not trained as architects to do the same work as architects. And but this, of course, you should, we shouldn't be intimidated by it. We should invent our own tools and our own systems and maybe our own software to be smarter. Um, this is a nice book I can recommend about the future of professions, what means, what it means in, in these days, how certain professions are maybe disappearing, uh, uh, like a lot of administrative stuff, uh, a lot of construction stuff will change, and, and, and of course the creative side is less easy to maybe um, efficient or make it more eff efficient and maybe the creative robot is not really there yet, but it, it's good to think about um, what it would mean. Eh? So you have, uh, uh, on the one hand, maybe uh, there, there, there are certain trends. These are kind of four possibilities. You have, on one hand, the, the unique author, the, the architect as a re unique creator. Uh, and they, uh, they, they want to protect um, uh, uh, the design and the kind of the stuff that he makes. So it's copyright. And on the other hand, you can see a trend in the, in that, that goes against it, where we share everything. So that means why don't you have to have a, need a copyright when you have, you have to share that? You, you can use all the stuff from others, make something better. And, you can, and on the other hand, you have uh, the innovation side where you think where everything, try to find something new versus the automation side where things are being more efficiently done and reproduced. And, and so architects can, well, in that fourth field, find their position. So this is a, a, an image from the Dutch Architecture Association where they imagine four scenarios for, for potential architects in, 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 in 20 years. So that's basically, roughly, if you're studying right now, this is pretty likely to be, uh, in 20 years, it's probably when you are super active. And there, you, could be, you could see that there's maybe entrepreneurs, which is a, maybe a more business-like architect, that they're thinking about efficiency and, 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 and maybe work in a, in, a, in a different way, versus the tech architect, Archinet, Archibot, in, in this kind of sharing side. In a simply, uh, to, to, to add a few words to that, uh, the entrepreneur uh, wants to create more value within less hours. So he doesn't like to work every night. So if you do invent something interesting, try to re reproduce it in a way that, that you can earn um, income with it. And on the other side, the tech architect is, 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 is a role in the complex building world where, where the architect is somehow still in, in the middle and tries to know everything and yeah, try to manage the complexity of certain construction sites. Uh, on the other side, the sharing side, where, where things can be combined, yeah, like certain elements can be developed, uh, shared and, and combined in 3D printing, or uh, everything can be scripted, but we also somehow do in our office. Certain people are specialists in that, in that part, and they, so we develop maybe ultimately all of them together. Okay, from Rotterdam to Malaga. I just flew from Rotterdam to Malaga, and it's a direct flight. Quite, quite nice. Rotterdam is a tiny airport. Malaga is a huge airport. Interesting. Um, but that was. Uh, um, and there's, a, there's more. There's many more interesting links. I actually have a secret uh, pleasure that's looking at statistical uh, sites, and this is a, uh, from a site called Numbio, and they uh, share. They have a look uh, and uh, uh, make an overview of all the cities. Um, uh, and affordability index. It means uh, how, um, yeah, how cheap or expensive it is to live in a certain place. And that means absolute numbers don't always say anything. So it depends on the income of the local people and the prices of the, of the local city. That, that defines the, the, the index between the affordability. So you see, for instance, here that it's pretty expensive to live in Ukraine. And all a lot of Asian cities or South American cities, and somewhere in here, Hong Kong. Okay, but that means that, that so where are, where's Europe? You can also click on that, that site and then you get Europe. So here in Europe, still uh, Belarus and Ukraine, not good. Um, but also, Eastern Europe is relatively expensive. You have London, but London is not even in the top 10. Tirana is, more, is less uh, affordable as London. 
So that's why I think it's good to know, to, to, that, uh, that as an architect, to see what's happening in, this, in the cities and how, how that is working there. Like Rome, yeah, I can imagine it's expensive. Paris, Stockholm. But nice to know what, where are the inexpensive places. Eh? What is, maybe it's good to know where, where it's cheap to live. Now it's getting interesting because you have uh, uh, Ostrava, a very cheap place, Malmö, and surprisingly number three in Europe, Malaga, and number four, Rotterdam. So I said, hey, this is quite cool. We have a link. Here we have we're almost the same affordability. Eh? So it means it's pretty much the same way of life. Maybe things are a bit more expensive in Rotterdam, but then we also get a little bit more money. And that, so every, you could say it's, it's more or less the same. And uh, you have also the Hague in Utrecht, so in Valencia. So these are, are, are places where it's pretty good, you could say. I mean, there's a reasonable balance between what you earn and what you, the cost of living. Interesting. So that was before I knew that I was coming here. And then, then I discovered this strange connection from Rotterdam to Malaga. Okay. Um, where do we go next? I'd like to show you um, some projects that we are doing in the Netherlands. Uh, suddenly, the Netherlands are doing well again, and it has been a bit, we had some crisis times as well, different ones than the one in Spain. Uh, but, but we also had, like, it was this, and then it went like this, and then it went, like, up again. And suddenly we were all busy and doing projects in Holland again. Before it was, we did mostly work outside Holland. Um, so, one thing we did was called a project called Ola Holanda. And, uh, and we went to even to go as, as far as uh, South America in Bogota. We made this house, this Dutch house, um, to show uh, the world um, Dutch literature. Um, but it was also a bit about a mentality that, that we like to explain. And I quickly show a few old stuff where, where it has to do with efficiency of space. Uh, that you build, that you have to build on, on places where normally you cannot build, or you you, you do these complicated things to make life uh, uh, and they say the world and the city more 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 efficient. Uh, but also the other side of Holland is, where, you know, it's almost like where they waste space and there's no density, no no attraction, and um, and this was more or less the message we wanted to to show the world in the pavilion that we made in 2000 for the Hanover Expo which was a vertical version of the Netherlands, combined out of small pieces of Holland, Dutch landscapes, stacked on top of each other. And that was Mensch Natur Technique, Man, Nature and Technology. That was the theme of that exposition. And um, two weeks ago, I was there again, and it uh, looks even worse like this. Um, but the good thing is that the pavilion is still there. It's a sort of modern ruin, and uh, somebody has now bought the, the, the plot and the building and we're going to um, to renovate it. So let's see. In a few years I can show you what it will come, what it will be. And next to this building there will be a housing uh, slab with uh, student apartments. And it's a typical thing that means yeah that the cities are growing, there's less space in the center, it's more difficult to find a room uh, and so that means many cities buy of built student apartments these days. Um, and it has to do with, yeah, maybe that, that, that certain places are, are, are exciting and it's good to live. Uh, and this density, what type of density do we like to make? Maybe this is what we should ask ourselves. Many of these projects that we are working on are dealing with um, uh, transformation and re-urbanization because there's a large urban areas that we, that we already made and now we have to improve them and repair them and transform them. So that means, yeah, that's one of the, the main issues we deal with. Uh, sometimes it doesn't mean everything is old. You can also make it in, instead of something else. And you see it in the city of Rotterdam, and this is an image from the, the, the waterfront over there, that it took like, like 25 years to, to, to get here. Eh? Like this is a, a slow urban planning in the center of, of the city. They didn't build it overnight, step by step by step. Uh, and on the other side of the city, you see uh, transformations with, from the harbor uh, into something else. Here you see a, a park, a new park on top of a shopping mall that offers a green space to the dense neighborhood uh, around it. It's not a very known project, but it's very nice in terms of uh, space use and conceptually I, I really like it. So yeah, Rotterdam. So this is more or less uh, like Rotterdam and, Ma and Malaga. Same affordability. This is the, how Rotterdam looks. It's a city of towers in, in the beginning. You, you could say uh, it's, the f yeah, it's more or less a very uh, almost non-European 
city when you look at it. It's a bit uh, American almost. Of course, it had to do with the, uh, with, the with the war damage, but it led to a certain freedom in uh, freedom in, uh, in ment mentality and also in construction and in architecture. People are not so protective uh, because there is nothing to protect. Okay, back to the statistical thing. If you look at Western Europe. Sorry, I just zoom in a bit more. You see then, the, these are the 18 cities in Western Europe in this graph, and you see that Rotterdam is the most affordable city in Western Europe. And uh, that, that means something, because that means that it's that attractive for certain people to go there and to find a place. And that's also maybe uh, why we are still uh, there. In our office, uh, uh, we just moved to a larger office in an older building. Old building. It's a building that was made, made after the war. Uh, it's uh, where some workshop spaces were transformed into a large um, architecture office. We made special meeting rooms depending on the atmosphere and the, and the clients and the topic. We, we choose a meeting room. Uh, we all we meet on the stair. Uh, we have lunch together on a big table. Uh, so it's a bit like an MPRV house. It's an office like a house. But the building is nice and interesting because this is one of the first buildings that was built after the war. Uh, in, in the center of Rotterdam was bombed uh, and there, were, there was a lack of <coughs> office space and uh, they planned this building which is kind of collective office. So it, it looked like a housing building uh, but it actually is, uh, the, there it contained many small office spaces and a collective workshop and we are now in that workshop. And here's an overview from the 50s from Rotterdam which was in this transition zone where we had to re rebuild the city. There is our building. And um, this is the center of Rotterdam with the cathedral. And um, well, this is the biggest building of Europe for a while. Uh, it's a similar building that our office is in, done by the same architect a few years later. And again, it has a lot, it contains a lot of smaller, it's like a big startup uh, complex, an incubator. Uh, Groot, the, the Groot Handelsgebouw, there's, there's cars driving through it, and it has a cinema on the roof. So it stood for, the rebirth of the city. Next to this building now, uh, t two years ago, the new station was built uh, and it sort of was a sign of the, of the uplifting of, this, um, of our city. Um, to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the uh, bombardment, uh, uh, we, uh, there, was, there were questions asked to the, to the, to the people, that, hey, please give us a good idea. We'd like to, do, to, to, to celebrate this momentum, what we achieved. And uh, we uh, made a proposal, and the mayor of Rotterdam said, I want it. And luckily, we got it. It was called the stairs, and it was a huge staircase from this plaza of the, of the train station to the cinema on top, to look from that building, that first building, the biggest building in Europe for a while, to look over the city to see what has been done. Also to lift up and to ad advocate for the second, the second layer in the city, the roof. This was the image we made in the rendering, and um, then we started to work together with the municipality. It had to be done super quick, and it was a real building with a building permit, and there were issues about safety, and you know, people with trucks driving around, and all these kind of things had to be taken care of, and luckily it got all handled, and this was all sorted out, and there we made the stairs, and it was a, a, an enormous success. Uh, it was supposed to be there for four weeks, but they had to extend it, uh, because of uh, yeah, the amount of people that came. Sometimes only one, but m m many cases it was like open from 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, and you can have uh, drinks on the roof, and you have a lot of parties, you have a lot of people coming with their families or people taking group pictures uh, on the stairs. Concerts were there, etc., etc. And uh, at night, yeah, there was this, this new rooftop bar that became uh, the cool place in town. And now it's gone. Suddenly, so this is a strange thing that you were walking there in the air and that, that this is a place where you would normally never go back again. Yeah, this, stairs, this will not come back and this momentum was there to celebrate the 75 years. Uh, but you can now uh, vote. Yeah, we can vote on this project. Actually, there's something image on top. It's the selected for the design prize in the Netherlands. And this, um, and, uh, it's the, the public award, so if you can give us some extra support, then we might win it. Okay, but in this project we also promoted more than just an, an intervention. It was also nice to imagine the future of Rotterdam by um, saying, hey, how could we use the space in our cities in a nicer way? It's pretty cool on the roof, so why don't we give more stairs, more access, and give me on this Marcel Breuer department store uh, a beautiful roof garden. 
Uh, or the Kunsthal from OMA. It's cool. It's even nicer to have him. There's, there are some trees already on that roof, but it could be interesting to, to imagine that the that roof could be activated. We already did a tiny, tiny roof extension. This is our first uh, building in Rotterdam. Uh, we had built a lot of stuff in other cities before we started to work in our own city. Uh, this is for friends that had needed some space. They had an old warehouse uh, where they worked. Got some kids. Suddenly everybody needed more, more space and the, the only way up was the roof. So we, we created three houses for them, one for the parents and two for the, their sons. And it was like a second home on top of your first home. And it was like a dream in the city. Um, but it stood also for us indeed for this activation of the, of the roof layer and for yeah, creating family houses in the center of the city, which is not always easy. Normally they make suburban houses. Uh, then that's easier than redensify. Okay, so now we have a bit more. We have now the market hall. We have this this tiny roof, um, and I'm going to show you a couple of the Rotterdam projects somehow, because somehow there is a small link between Malaga and Rotterdam. Right. First to the market hall. Um, you might might have seen this project, but it stands for also for the. Uh, 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 it's important for us, for the city, but also uh, let's say as a momentum in our in our career to make a large building in, in, the, in our hometown. And it's next to the, the, the main train track, which was um, right in the center here. It's now underground. This is the cathedral. They made a huge tunnel. Uh, and on that, on that tunnel, there's now the, the market, <coughs> twice a week. The city wanted to promote, uh, yeah, to have a market seven days a week, a bit like you have in Spanish cities as well. And they also wanted to have more apartments more people living in the center because it was very business-like there. So now it's there, it's, it's actually in the, yeah, it's a combination of a market and, a, and an apartment block and the apartments, they made the arch, they make an arch and this arch is spanning the space and gives the market much more space, in short. But the cool thing is that it's actually, uh, in the old days, here's the cathedral, this was this train thing, uh, the, it used to be the market square. And so the, the market hall, the market hall is on top of the former market. But the whole city, of course, this is, you can see traces, but it's practically, it's n there's no history anymore. So this is a, a, a spot where you find archaeological findings of the, of the traces of the past. And you, then people realize that the city was uh, started in 1200. It's not a, that new. Um, so, but it's also a big block in the center. Here you have the cathedral again, that's the new square. And this new square is so large that it also needs large buildings. And that's why we proposed a sort of yeah, a clear thing. This is the starting point. And then by flipping it up, you create a roof that's in that and you create more, more space in the building. And yeah, somehow a more smart uh, um, solution for the apartments as well, because suddenly we have penthouses. So the whole thing came together. It was a solution that everybody uh, liked when we showed it. And, and also the city planning office and our, uh, the, the, the department in the jury um, said, okay, let's go for it, even though it was a bit risky as well. It was also complicated because there's a huge garage below, below and it's not the best soil in Holland. We have a lot of water, uh, so it was complicated to build. Um, but, the, but, but, but there it is, and it's now a kind of urban living room for the city of Rotterdam. In short, this is the section, and this is more or less explains it all. It's here you see the garage, there's a supermarket access from the ground where you pass all these archaeological findings, shops and um, restaurants, the market in the middle and all the apartments on top, and the penthouses here with a special roof garden. So our, our diagram, we, we, once, uh, we, we kept on talking to our client that we that it w what it was like to live there, uh, and so he hired this cartoonist to, uh, to show that. So yeah, the idea is yeah, you can live there, you can basically catch the fish of the day uh, from your house. Ultimately, that was not so easy because fire regulations and everything. So now yeah, in the end, you have to go down, but still it is a similar atmosphere that you are living in a market. It's completely different. And it was for some people also questionable, like, hey, do people like to live there? But yes, the people like to live there. They really sold out the apartments pretty quick. Some of it are for rent, some of it are for sale. And uh, it's a mixed bunch of people that, that live there. Later, when the building was finished, we went 
to see a few of them living there. And you can see that depending on this wall, the arch is changing. The higher up in the building they are, the more <coughs> angular this, this wall is towards the market. This is another layer. Everybody more or less made their own interior. So we, we gave their simple basic layouts and things like the kitchen and the bathroom, they, they were done by the people themselves. <coughs> so a quick home tour. She's actually uh, uh, our favorite tenant of the building, right. and, and she's always receiving guests. And when we have guests, we can call her up, she opens the door, and the dog is always very happy when architects come in. Anyway, but in this, this, this her, her, her neighbors, for instance, they have a bit more narrow house, but they also have this garden on the roof and a window to the market hall. So this is kind of a duplex apartment on the, of the penthouse. And then this is where you have your, they have their private garden uh, with a glass floor. But the regular apartments, they have a view to the, to the city, with, for instance, to the cathedral, and they're then, yeah, more or less normal. Yeah? So it's a combination of something strange, but <coughs> something rather um, ordinary. What's, what's very important for us is that we had these views from the center of the hall to the city, so that we worked on this uh, yeah, facade construction that would not block the view. And if you have a large glass facade, it was needed for the wind and the rain protection, uh, yeah, you would have to have a big steel structure to uh, resist the wind forces. But by, by making a net, a kind of tennis racket net, uh, that in tension in two directions, we could eliminate the steel structure and only have cables, which means diagonally you can look through that facade to the city. It was a, yeah, a kind of structural invention that, that, that we worked on together with an engineer. Where we, indeed, then the arch again was so strong that, it was a, that we were able to, yeah, to, to tie up this net of steel cables. And, and this actually moves a little bit. And actually that movement is, is makes it possible that, that we can yeah, make it rather thin and, and flexible. At night, the building shines out like a, like a, like a warm, glowing, um, uh, colorful world. And yeah, it's of course, you look where we have, we are inspired by, by this one. Um, and, and it was not easy, of course, to convince everybody um, what we could do with the ceiling. Because in the beginning, we actually thought it could be nice to make one gigantic LED screen with lots of, like a big TV. Even though the prices of the LEDs went down, it was not feasible with the energy and everything. So we needed a solution, and the, the solution was in the, in the form of an art piece. It was a competition between artists, and um, here you see uh, the jury. And this is, these are the developers uh, testing the, the art piece, uh, what it would be. So this was the entry that was done by the local artist, Arno Kuhne. There were very different artists selected. One was more or less a street artist, one was more from the high art, there was a photographer, there were, there were different combinations. Uh, but this guy won. And uh, it, it was a gigantic computer file that was printed on aluminium panels. And because of this technology, you can make every panel different. Uh, so it's not like a silk screen. Uh, but it was a me mega, mega file, and it needed uh, sort of extra forceful render machines from Disney to help us, from Pixar, to help it realize. Uh, 4,000 panels, two soccer fields um, of metal, um, but the effect is really sensational in the combination of the architectural space, basically that, that was part of our, our project, and the artwork, artwork together. They really, uh, yeah, one and one is three. Um, and it attracts many visitors that just pass by uh, to take pictures and tourists as well. So it's like a chapel, a food, a food market cathedral. Um, and it raised uh, the attention to Rotterdam, but it was not done like you have in Bilbao with a, with a big museum. It was done with a, a housing block and a food market. So it's a, a building that's not elite at all. It's more or less the populist building in the city in Rotterdam is also politically quite an interesting place, but that's a different story. Um, so it's in a way, it's easy access. Yeah, and then people bring their friends or their families and every day when I go to the office, I pass by this building and there's always a autobus of Chinese tourists standing there. So they also come to Rotterdam and they didn't come before. Here are some images of this. But of course, we, during this process, we went several times to Spain so you can see there is a, another link between the market of Rotterdam and Spain. Here you see the garage and the, the entrance in the middle. It's like a cascade of escalators. 
and from there you come out into the market, into the city, and the contrast between the, the, the colorful inside and the gray outside comes from the fact that yeah, on the, in the city the, the pavements is, are, are the same color. So we like to have that this building comes almost out of the ground, it's absorbing the color of the street in gray granite. So that's, that's why, why this decision was made on the, on the material. What happened was that this was building really activating the whole neighborhood. Uh, so it was a bit of a dead part of the city center. And now, uh, yeah, this whole activity moved eastwards to the center, a bit more on the, the west part of the town, towards the, west, the east part, and it's actually where our office is. And the whole thing is, uh, yeah, becoming more and more alive. So that's the center of Rotterdam, and then you have this other bit on across the river, the River Maas, uh, with the Erasmusbrug van UN Studio. And this is a high-rise area, which is sort of the, f the first real high-rise zone in, in Holland that started, uh, I think, beginning of the 90s, the first buildings were, were, were made. And right now, yeah, the, mo the top 10 of the highest buildings in Holland are all in Rotterdam. And this is more or less the, it's not, it's not super, super high, it's not America, it's like 150, 100, 180 meters more or less, that's, that's what it is. But it's, there's many of them, and that's quite interesting. Next uh, year, construction starts of the first one that's going over the 200 meters with the top of the, of the tower. It's not a super beautiful one, but it doesn't matter. It's a high tower and people are really big fan of high rises. And uh, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the people of Rotterdam say they're, they're proud about this identity and somehow they, they don't mind. Uh, whereas in Amsterdam, it's, people are against it and every tower should be lower to protect the historical skyline. And we were... Uh, actually designing uh, uh, the second highest tower of Rotterdam now. We just won a competition. I'm going to explain it quickly. Um, it will be a, one of the, yeah, one of a new, large, um, important project in our city. And it's super cool to be able to make a tower. Um, this is called the sax, the saxophone. Uh, that was the name that was given to the, to the project by the, by the client. And it's part of this master plan on the tower, which is actually originally made by uh, Foster and Partners a long time ago. They also made a, a tower for the harbor um, agency. Here you have an old hotel where the, 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 the immigrants from, from, from Europe would take the, the boat to America, the office of the Holland America line. There's a couple of residential towers we made. Uh, uh, Alvaro Cesar made a big tower, uh, OMA uh, complex, and uh, this was the location for the, the competition. I showed this image before, this is already, uh, the, you, you are in the middle of the harbor and this, suddenly you have this skyline there, which, which gives the city a new, a new look, um, because you have this wa big, big water spaces, the case, uh, and it becomes somehow, after more and more towers are being made, it becomes something <coughs> exciting. This is the outline of the competition, there was already a design made by the, by the client, they wanted to, to, to have two towers connected with a hotel, and um, we developed, uh, uh, yeah, this was more or less roughly given, but we saw this as, as the missing link between the towers that were already there, for instance the CISA tower, the OMA block, and this is something in between, a bit of a hybrid. So it has a connection, a horizontal connection in the form of a hotel, a roof terrace, and yeah, an interesting plinth with a lot of stuff that had to be solved. The program is housing for rent, housing for sale, hotel and uh, retail spaces. Um, so we actually merged the two into one, one building, so it's not a stack of, of elements, but a kind of almost like a, yeah, the, the shape of a saxophone in, in a certain way, with this hotel uh, punching through. And so that was the image we uh, finally delivered. So it was not that, that, that we, we had to do a lot of volume studies, because there was hardly, the, the zoning was very, very strict. We had to focus on other things. We had to focus on the, on the quality of the apartment and uh, solve the complexity of the, of the ground floor. Rotterdam is also a city of, of jazz music. Um, it's the, it has the biggest jazz festival of Europe. And uh, it's the, this kind of rough edge harbor feeling that people like. And uh, so that's why maybe these developers chose the, the saxophone as a, as, a, as a kind of name, as a nickname for this, for this, for this tower. But on that pier uh, where we built, you see these are the other towers, the facades. This is the OMA one, the Meccano one, the CISA one, and another one from a Dutch architect. So it's the typical regular facades, they're all a little bit different, each has their own material. Uh, so what to add? We, th we, would, we, we somehow felt it would not be attractive to make another regular facade. So we tried to find something different. 
we started looking at, at Rotterdam that was there already. And Rotterdam, because of this modern image in the, in the center, you see a lot of balconies on the street side, which is not so common for Dutch cities. And bay windows, so the combination of a, of a, of a kind of bay window and a, and a balcony is a very useful, you see a lot. So we thought, okay, this could be uh, a driving force for the, for the quality of living there. So that if we emphasize this bay window, you can have even more view than if you, in a regular facade, yeah, in a, one of the simple balcony. So we're making a super bay window uh, uh, as an additional element to your house. This could be the bonus, because every architect, every tower on that spot would already be nice, because the, the views are great, uh, the apartments will sell anyway. So what to add? And we thought, okay, adding it was to optimizing this, the qualities of, this, of the spot and the quality of the apartment in the form of this bay window. But also you can combine the bay windows into two or in vertically, horizontally, in an L or in an, uh, around the corner to, to have a different sort of plug-in in in your apartment. And on top of them, uh, balconies could be made, outdoor spaces, in a similar way, sometimes a small one, large one, L1, duplex, or l shape. So this would be a kind of collection of uh, indoor and outdoor spaces that form a three-dimensional uh, zone around this sort of standard tower. Uh, and that could mean that it would maybe form this sort of improvisational layer that would differentiate uh, this tower from the other ones. Here a diagram on, on the housing plans. So you have a simple floor plan as a starting point, but then this basic house can have an additional layer of adi some spaces on the facade that give, make your house different as a house from the neighbor be below or above you. So it allows for a certain freedom in the regularity of the tower structure, which has to be very efficient to make it work. Uh, and that would also, for, for us from the inside out, uh, think that this bay window could be an identification for your apartment. Eh? So you could do certain things that you like in your house that will make the use of your bay window different from the people in the in, uh, surrounding you. So, yeah, your friends you have your family, or you have a, you, have a, you use the bay window for a romantic dinner, or it's a kind of relax zone, or it's a music corner, or it's the sport corner, or it's the kids zone, or it's the yoga zone. So this is the sort of the place you need. Uh, you create this, uh, this tiny room connected to the main room as a as a kind of additional quality of life. The render image, that is always important in architecture competitions, fancy renders. Um, but in the way, these are always, these are even nicer. I like this actually better than, than this one, but uh, it's, it's part of the job. Um, and here you see the facade, this three-dimensional zone, which is more or less like the, like the improvisational layer in, that, in, the, in the kind of court scheme of the facade of the building, like in that is a reference to the jazz music. Um, and it makes every house slightly different, and the combination of houses, again, makes the whole thing again very different. So from, the, from, from far away, it, it's a simple tower, but when you zoom in, there's this rich layer of uh, activities in the facade. Quickly, the, the build-up, there's a garage, there's a retail spaces, a hotel, compact parking, lots of bicycle parking, uh, some apartments in the plint, and the tower up. So it has around 500, 500 apartments, quite a lot of small apartments, because this is, has to do again with the affordability of the city. Even though Rotterdam is not that expensive, there's still a lot of people that cannot afford a bigger house. So that we say, okay, let's make smaller houses, but then make them in a way that, that, that you don't need more, eh? that you make that you maybe are fine with a small house by making the city more exciting. Here's a layer of the bay windows. And this is the effect of the of the building. Right now, we, this is just we won this competition two months ago, and now we're de developing. Uh, yeah, we're in the preliminary design, so it's quite early. On the ground level, very important for the city was how, what, what what the quality is on the ground level, because many of these towers on that pier are not that great on the ground level. So we said, okay, how can we do do, do it better? And we thought we might make make a kind of skyline in mini miniature. So this is like a like like the like the streetscape, the, like the skyline, the street line. Yeah, so you have, like you have the skyline from far away and the street line from, from close by. So it has different heights, different uh, activities, and a more diverse elevation. So instead of a, a regular plint, the plint is like this. And that gives, we think it gives more excitement, and uh, that, that place get needed, could need a bit more excitement. 
So lots of possibilities in that plint. Um, let's zoom out and that's the tower again. That's a little Go to the next project. I, I, I do a few, like if you have two large construction or uh, uh, yeah, new market halls, you could say, uh, in Rotterdam. This is the third one, which just started construction. It's a, the depot for art. Um, it's uh, next to the main art museum of Rotterdam. Okay, what's the depot? It's not a museum. It's something else. And why would we need one in the center of the city? Good question, because on a, when you build on such a prominent spot, this first question is this, this. but the, the main reason is there's a gigantic art collection that's in danger, uh, as the main city of, the main museum of Rotterdam, uh, or most of the uh, storage space for the art are in the basement, and every time it rains severely, we have a problem. And there's other spaces, and there's, uh, it's a bit of a mess, and it's very, very expensive, so the city decided, together with the art museum, we really need a solution for this. And, um, but what to do? You can either make a depot for art somewhere in the business park, far away, and then trucks drive between the business park and the museum. But this was not that, that exciting. Um, the city wanted to activate the park, and there was a private sponsor as well, who said, okay, I like this idea of the, of the depot, and I like to participate in it. But there's a certain condition. One of the conditions is that uh, it has to be close 200 meters distance from the existing museum. And that meant that there was only one place available that was in the park next to the museum, which was a sensitive issue, of course. In the beginning, earlier stages of, of the project, we participated in a kind of uh, fundraising event. We were not selected at that moment for the museum, but it was, uh, we, were, we knew the, the director. And we proposed a big table, a big table that would be above the plaza in the park that would create a rain-free <coughs> space for all kinds of activities. That was the pitch that we made in 2007, like a super, super table. That all, the, all the art was then uh, high and dry, so if, it, if there would be global warming and Rotterdam would flood, the art was safe. That was the, the message, because going down into the ground is not good, and this was like, if you lift it up completely, then we have this additional space and everything's on top. It was a kind of provocative statement, and we, we also made a one to ten model on the art fair, the biggest art fair in Amsterdam, where Rotterdam was then showing off this new art depot. Some images of that. And um, yeah, the competition was held. It was a tough competition uh, with court cases and everything. Uh, but in the end, we won it, and um, uh, with something completely different. Uh, the building was much bigger than, than before, and this whole table thing wasn't working. Um, here you see the connections from the city uh, along um, uh, through the park to the Kunsthal from OMA. It's there in the neighborhood. This is the museum. There's another uh, villa. There's the Architecture Institute. It's now called New Institute. There's the Nature Museum. So there's lots of museums in that place. Uh, and this is the volume. It's a huge block of um, cubic meters uh, of art storage and conservation spaces, but also some exhibitions, small exhibition spaces. And we thought, okay, uh, let's make it round because then it's, it has no backside. And then it is a building in the park and there's other institutions around it, so they all are looking to the front, so we make it round. As another example, uh, advantage that we could make it less, that the impact of the building is less. And by pushing it on the bottom, um, the, 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 the area used for the building was smaller and the area on the roof would, would be larger which could actually be uh, maybe used for something else. P a public roof terrace, for instance, so that we, ha we give something back to the city in the form of a viewing platform. <coughs> and this, all these viewing lines and the routes would, would be yeah, more or less minimized by the impact of the building. So that was the position where it had to be. And the facade, the next thing was about the facade. We thought, okay, if we make it like a mirror, uh, it can be almost invisible, right? it can reflect the surrounding, the mostly nature, uh, uh, and it could also reflect the plaza, and the plaza would almost become the facade. So the activities on the plaza, which could be an art e an event or uh, a fair, would then be reflected and you could see it from further away. Here you see a bit of a diagram of this. And but an another thing that we, we found out that you could look around the corner, so if you look, um, if you stand there, you can you could, you could look around the corner what's happening there, and this almost makes you more aware of what, what, what's in the surrounding, and you can see things in the city in a different way. So it reflects this 
a very strange skyline as well. And at night, uh, some lights come up because it's a, it's a depot, so it's a storage building. It doesn't have a lot of windows. Here and there, you you, you see then life in the building appearing. And um, that's it. So the park, it's a museum park. It, it, it's, it's designed by OMA. Uh, it, it's quite a, uh, yeah, one of the few bigger green span zones in the center. And, and here we um, we're zooming in up to the building. It, it, it used to have a, a small garden in, uh, with acacia trees. We replaced them on the roof. In the end, it turned out to be birch trees because acacias were not that sustainable um, over there. But this is the, the idea. You, we, we, make it, we, make, we make a better park on the ground and another one on the roof. Giving you a quick tour, we are now, uh, in the, the building started construction half a year ago. I quickly go, so on the ground level you have uh, on one side a kind of official entrance for the art, which is more or less a kind of safe entrance, and on the other side uh, the entrance for the public. And it has a, a large hall with a lift directly to the sky, to the cafe on the roof. And on the other hand there's this sort of internal route for the, for the uh, let's say the official the, the, the storage route. So it has this combination of a, a yeah, you, as, 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 as a visitor you are more or less guest in the art storage. The building cannot have too many visitors. But it is important that you can see then suddenly the, all the collection in a random way. Things that are normally not shown in the museum you can, you can then suddenly discover. Uh, and we made one gigantic void inside the building that could contain that kind of a, a random selection of, of art pieces. And from there, yeah, you can, with a special guided tour, discover what the city has in, in its collection. So here's a typical floor of storages. This is then the public route in the middle, and it goes up like this. A slit from the, from the bottom to the top, the skylight above. And it's like this gigantic, yeah, almost like John Soane's house of, 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 of paintings and art pieces and sculptures that you suddenly see from the bottom to the top with a, a series of diagonal stairs passing through you, then you walk around and you take the next one, you walk around, take the next one, either from the top to the bottom or vice versa. And at night, it has this mysterious feeling. Some images showing that. We made studies on how that, that big piece of furniture could be used, yeah, so it's an ex exhibition space in the form of a cupboard. And, um, it's, it's the main, yeah, the, sort of the highlight of the building. But besides that, you have then yeah, the storage spaces where you can pull out the, the, the paintings. They're like a, uh, in a radial format. Um, further up to the, to the top, where you have another additional gallery space <coughs> for flexible exhibitions. But also restorations can take place. And you can see there, yeah, it's a, it's a space for interaction. This is again some images from that circulation space and to the top you have a, a larger exhibition space um, from the Vera Berge, which is this private sponsor which is then for public exhibitions but special shows can be held on top of the, of, of the highest floor Up on, the, on the roof we have a small roof pavilion uh, and the garden which is like a mini forest in the center of the city uh, that contains uh, like, a, it's like, a, like a greenhouse and outdoor, um, you have that forest feeling. A dense birch tree forest uh, where you can picnic, where you, have, where you can have drinks and have a great uh, overview of the city. So that's, that was, that was the, the project, but it took a long time, let's say, to participate and to involve everybody. And there was images of the, of the museum right now where they showed the project, but there were also lectures where we had to explain the building to the general public. Uh, there was the museum had a, a bicycle that would cycle around on certain uh, festivals, showing the people the, the, the museum and on that where you can take pictures from your with your helmet on, on with the museum on top. Um, you could take pictures uh, with the building and post them on the internet on social media. There were art installations marking the the out the building and right now it's under construction. We're testing the facade here in a in a, in a construction company that. Uh, make these kind of curved glass facades, and uh, I hopefully in, in what about one and a half years it will be finished. But then it will also take one and a half years to to house in the, all the art, and also the building needs a half a year to, uh, to to calm down for a little because the, the climate is super sensitive. 
it has to be yeah, for the, the most precious artworks. So all the, the concrete has to, the water has to come out of the concrete so that the climate is more or less stabilized. Then the art pieces come in. So it will take a while before you can visit it. But it will already be visit, visible uh, quite soon. Okay, I'll move on to another project that's, that's very Dutch. And uh, hopefully I'm okay with the time. Um, it's a building uh, uh, which is collect, it's a cultural center um, near Amsterdam. Um, and it deals with a bit with the, the, the debate in the Netherlands in architecture about uh, tradition and modernity. Um, this is a book from a journalist from one of the main newspapers of uh, Holland, say the El Pais of Holland, uh, and he's the architectural critic. Um, and he, he, has his, he made this book about recent architecture in Holland called Double Dutch. Of course, Double Dutch has a double meaning, it has two sides of the coin. And, Everybody knows the market hall, and also these modern buildings are very well known outside Holland. But inside Holland, there's also a lot of traditional architecture that you might not know here. It hasn't been published so much abroad. But it's very popular in terms of, uh, let's say, the general, pub the general public likes to have a traditional house, uh, the average Dutchman, so to say. In the suburbs, you see houses that look old, but actually are quite new. And um, this project is in a city uh, that's very famous for their uh, uh, wooden houses, uh, Zaanstad. Touristically attractive as well. Um, and instead of making another similar city extension and city center development, uh, the city of Zaandam hired an interesting architect uh, who was more or less from the traditional side. But um, he, he made something that is not purely traditional, but also quite modern as well. So he made kind of fusion between the two. This is the traditional housing style, but here's, for instance, the town hall of the same city that this guy designed, Schultz Suters, um, enlarged uh, uh, traditional houses. Uh, there's this hotel done by another architect together with Suters, which is like a stack of, of old houses. Could have been a project from us. We really liked it in a way, <laughs> sort of vertical village. Uh, but here you see it's, it's a bit of a, a, a combination of Disneyland because it has a waterfall, it's just like, uh, like you have in the casinos in, the, in, in Las Vegas. Hey, a bit like, but it's, so it's really um, popular with the general public and um, people embraced, they're very proud about it. Um, so that's the, 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 the typical Zaanse architecture. Um, so it's very old school Dutch, you could say. And the competition was about for a new building in that same master plan, uh, where we had to deal with this interpretation of traditional architecture. So what to do? Uh, it was clear that if we would ma make a completely radical modern project, we would never win the competition. Uh, it was also not what we wanted to do. We wanted to make something that would fit in the surroundings, but, but also not exactly copying it. Here, this is the starting point, the typical house, in a way the, the typical Dutch house. What was done was, the enlargement by the town hall, this trick we couldn't do. Stacking it, also done. So what's next? What could we imagine? What trick is there available? We started looking at, at, at uh, the, the, the program. This is actually a building for all these cultural institutions of Zaandam that had to be joined into one house. This was part of a cost reduction for the municipality because now they had eight or different institutions and now they can have all in one, so they have only one building and they can sell off these other buildings. Uh, so that was decided. And if you didn't agree, then your subsidy was cut. So, so all the institutions had to do, it was like a forced marriage. And we thought, okay, if, we, if there, it was a bit like, a, if it's like a forced marriage, maybe we should give them all their own identity inside that, inside that new building. It's called the Cultural Cluster, that's the name of the building. Um, and then by this identity could maybe be a house, like the, the typical Zaanse house. But instead of making it in a, in a kind of massive format, we thought it would be interesting to, to see it as a, as a void space, as, an, as, an, <coughs> as a room, as a living room. In, the, in Dutch, the word huiskamer is, means house room. So it's a strange double meaning, but it basically it means the living room. And this big main space could be the collective living room for, every, for everybody. So each institution had their mini living room and together they have a big one. So that was then the story. And we said, okay, we can then in this collection of the stacking and the large houses, we make the negative house. We make a, a straight block with a historical shape carved out of it. 
So it's like an inverted, inverted house. In short, this is the diagram. We imagine every institute, the library, the music school, uh, the, um, the, the film house, uh, the radio, that each of them have a, has, have, have a room, a collective space, and they, they're carved out, out, of the, out of the volume, and the, the rest space, they miss the, the general functions that they share, offices and uh, exhibition rooms and so on. So here, um, the diagram of it. So it is a block with a lot of empty houses carved out of it, crossing through. Um, this is also um, um, something that could be explained quite easily to the, to the users of the building, meaning that they, they, they still have their own identity, but they're, they're part of a, of a larger family. And so you have the individual spaces and the collective spaces. Now we are again, he's also almost construction starts soon. This is a 3D BIM model showing the building. Another element which is important is the in, in, uh, inversion of the interior and the exterior. So what we like to do is that the normal thing that you have on the exterior, have it in the interior, and have what, what you normally have on the interior, you have on the exterior, because this building is inverted. This is the image we made for the, for the competition. Um, this is also a competition. So this was then a facade on the outside that have maybe a wallpaper feeling, and on the inside, the interior facade is like the out exterior facade. facade. This was the image we made in the early stages, and the image from the outside. And somehow it, it, it's interesting because this is the last building in that master plan and next door there are regular boxes. So it was surprisingly a good answer that it would be the, the transition zone from the historical Disneyland to the real world where you have still the, the kind of echo of, of historical spaces inside a more modern frame. Okay, tiny movie. This is the movie that the city made to promote the building and it uh, explains to the general public how it works. There you see it, Sandam. This is the um, elevated street across the station. The main lobby. The golden door down towards the, uh, the music center where you have the concert hall for mostly for uh, rock concerts. On the other side you have the uh, film house where you have the arts, the art film center for the alternative movies. And higher up there's this, this called the, fac the fabriek, the factory. So here you can watch the movie. There you have the radio, local radio station, the local library, and then on the, on the left side, on the pink, you have the uh, creative center where you can do um, classes in uh, music, in classes in dance, and modern art. So it's more, let's say, the amateur art center. With a performance, a performance uh, an auditorium for performances, for small concerts. So, uh, concerts of the kids doing uh, guitar music or so. so that, that is, uh, every time there's a small event taking place. Higher up, the top floor with all the um, practicing rooms, the exercising rooms for, for music lessons, dance lessons, pottery and all that thing, things. And on top a small uh, outdoor cinema. So then um, um, during this design process we had in intense contact with our um, master planner uh, uh, making uh, yeah, the historical design basically and it was an interesting, dis interesting discussion about how to deal with uh, local uh, history uh, and translate it into, um, into, into, into something else. So especially with the facade we were not completely happy yet so after the first stage of the, of the project we went into the technical design and we went back to the design of the facade pattern, which is the, out, the indoor-outdoor facade. And we want to have a sort of vitrage that you normally see in, in old Dutch houses, in front of the windows, to have that as an inspiration for the facade. Um, so, together with a graphic designer, because somehow architects cannot do everything, eh? I told it in the beginning, you have to ask somebody who's better at it than you are, in this case a, a, female desi uh, a graphic designer, Nicole, 
um, who was really good in 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 um, translating patterns patterns into uh, in, yeah to creating new new patterns. And she went with us with the to the local museum where we studied uh, uh, the the lace, the, the old old traditional clothes from uh, the region. Uh, there's all kind of inter inter interesting uh, tiles, which actually yeah, the the Delft blue tiles, probably quite similar to what you have here in the south of Spain and in Portugal, but with of course each their unique patterns, um, the, the the normal dresses of the women, and the and the jewelry, um, the Dutch, especially this part of Holland, uh, their wealth was especially kept in the in the in the jewelry of the women. Uh, the houses were of wood. So when there was a fire, they would just run out with the jewels on, and that was basically the main uh, value, so to say. And then they would start again, you could say. Um, so all these all this textures were put on the facade uh, of the different elements of the, of, the, of, the, of the cultural history. And out of them, yeah, we, we started, started to weave them together, literally to new patterns um, that would form this, this, this kind of traditional um, uh, pattern merged into something new. So here you see that, that in more detail. We then blurred it into a texture that could be perforated on metal. And we now, just today, uh, this morning, I saw the first, uh, the first panel. Um, and that you can still look from the outside to the inside and vice versa. So sometimes it's a bit more clear. And here there's, there's, there's windows behind. Sometimes you, some of them you can open. But this is then the effect you will see uh, on the street. Last project, and then we have some drinks, hopefully. Um, something that have been, we have been uh, building in Amsterdam, uh, and it's also dealing with traditional uh, architecture and modern technology. Uh, it's called the Crystal Houses. And it is on the main street in uh, Amsterdam, very close to the, the big museums, the Van Gogh Museum, uh, the Concertgebouw, the, the Concert House. So it's also on a spot where many visitors come. And this was actually a residential street um, that turned slowly into a uh, retail street and, uh, in, uh, where the most fancy brands of the world are there. Uh, every city has, big city has one of these streets. The PC Hofstraat is called a tiny street actually with residential houses on top and fancy boutiques on the ground level. Um, so what we wanted to do is that, that we could create somehow we wanted to return back to this old atmosphere that was there before, but at the, at the same time, with a kind of uh, attracting attractivity of the modern brand of the of the kind of global the global style. And it had to be fancy, but it also had to be traditional and and, and local. The diamond scene, the diamond quarter of Amsterdam is around the corner, uh, so it should be almost like a diamond combined with a traditional house. That was the diagram. There was an old house there before. This was the design. And they modified the ground floor. They opened up and made a sh large shop window where, and these apartments were inaccessible anymore because this was the shop window, the staircase and the door was gone, became storages. And right now the city wants to promote uh, that these apartments become uh, occupied again. And so it's possible to make uh, new buildings if you integrate this, these apartments better. So there was the old design and there was a new project being designed which was a little bit higher, then we were asked to find a solution for the facade. We went to the archive of the city, looked at it, the original drawings that were made for these buildings, and um, this was more or less what it looks like. It's from 1874, um, and now the, the design hut was transformed. The design that was made by another architect for that building, uh, when our client bought the, the, the whole project and he said, well, this is not what I want, but this is, this is allowed. So please make me a nicer project and, and, and uh, so that I, uh, make me happy basically, make me happy, that's somehow what all clients want. Um, so we, went, we should we propose to him, let's do it again, but then based on the original design so that it perfectly fits in the original uh, uh, streetscape, a bit like this. Uh, because somehow on certain spots we don't need modern architecture. Uh, but we should maybe do something special because this is not a shop anymore. So we propose maybe we should do it all out of glass. Exact the same design, only one different thing is the material. 
well, that was a nice idea. We started to laugh and say, okay, maybe we should do it a bit more, a bit like this or like this. We, we, we had to change it a bit into bricks because also part of the, of the city planning office is, okay, it should, it should merge better with the surrounding. So a combination of glass and brick is maybe the best thing. So we ended up with a, with a great combination, apartments on top, and a transition a kind of gradient from bricks into glass bricks. And that was the dream that we had. It's important to have dreams, even though we didn't know how to do it. So it was a great, a great plan, but we had a problem in the way how, how to realize it. These were the renderings. Still, it's okay, it works in rendering, but how does it work in reality? We started to think about a solution in a simple way, like making it out of sheets of plastic, uh, where the bricks were, were like were pieces of, 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 of a thicker plastic on, the, on top. So you could see, yeah, not fantastic. And then we imagined that the, the window frames would also be out of, uh, out of plexiglass and then the real glass. So basically a normal design, but everything transparent. You have to start somewhere. This was, of course, not, not great, but it, this was the start of the studies. Then we, we discovered a fantastic brick from Italy. It was a glass brick um, made in Venice. And it had this thing that, that when you see it, you are hooked. So uh, it feels very good, it was heavy, and it, was, it has beautiful uh, light. So we imagined, would it be nice if we had these bricks and glued them together? And then you yeah, still have the window frames, because we wanted to have the window frames as well. Went to the factory, and these guys said, well, yeah, these window frames, that's no problem. We can, we can make anything you want. Yeah, we can make bricks for you, but we can also make window frames for you out of glass. So when we went back to our clients, we said, look, guys, this is... This is, we have we found a solution, but it's a bit more expensive than, uh, than imagined. Uh, but of course, when you then see it, he couldn't resist it. So he said, yes, why not? Let's go for it. And then it became a project uh, where we wanted to go for perfection. And uh, it was almost not architecture anymore, where you always have to think about money. Um, this, this client was also an art collector, and he realized that the price of the facade would be more or less the price of a, of, a, of, a, of a good painting. So that means architecture is quite cheap when you compare it to art. Uh, and so you can do something special. So we went together with the university in Delft, uh, the material department, and uh, we did tests on the strength of the glue and how we could glue the bricks together. Um, new glue technologies with ultraviolet light. So when you go, for instance, to the dentist and you have this, this ultraviolet light, eh, that these this new technologies and new materials um, come up, and suddenly when you put this ultraviolet light, the, the glue immediately gets super, super hard. Now, you glue, a glue the few bricks together into a beam, and then yeah, it, it holds. It was, it was possible. It seems to, be, seems to work. But the big test was, of course, yeah, can it really, be, is it really strong, strong, strong enough to... Uh, to get building permission, because nothing has been done before. Uh, the city liked the idea, uh, so we had to test it. And, uh, this was also another additional cost for our client, but it was also an adventure. So here, for instance, we made an architrave out of pieces of brick that would, you would normally have in the traditional facade. All these pieces were made into glass. And here I'll show you another tiny movie. of the test. A special tool that was made to glue every brick horizontally so every time it would be rotated a little bit so that it would, the glue would not leak away. Classical mechanical test. How much load can you can, can it handle? This is done in the laboratory of the University in Delft. So 
much more and more pressure was on it and measured how strong it was until it would break and it proved to be extremely strong so that was good news we had our uh, approval and we had the, the proof that the material is actually several yeah ten times stronger as concrete in terms of pressure of course the glue it was different and there we had to do this test but this worked as well so then next thing was building it and um, it was made uh, it took a while because every brick had to be glued with the lamp step by step so it was slow but precise a bit like making a making a model but the result was amazing it's a building that you like to touch and passers-by stop and, 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 and hold that kids pass by. Like, 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 it's like ice, it's like magic. So every, when you stand there for a while, uh, uh, within half an hour, you can make several pictures of people touching uh, uh, tactile to feel what, it, what the facade is like. Okay. And then one last image to end with a small construction movie. And this also shows the the, yeah, the the history of the material, yeah, where, where the bricks come from. This is in, in, in Italy. The demolition of the old buildings, and then it starts. around 40 to 50 euro per piece. So it, 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 the city allowed additional uh, permits to have, now normally you are not allowed to have this sidewalk blocked for so long, but they accepted it because of the special building qualities. And inside, slowly, slowly, the facade came together, the glass facade. Thank you very much.